Matt, good morning to you, sir. Good morning. Great to be with you all. Great, Great to, to have you here. Person. Sure. Yeah. Uh, and you're here because you're going to be appearing locally at a school, I understand. I am. and had some nice meetings yesterday with various folks around the town and uh, coming back from a big meeting over in D.C. where I was with all the new secretaries of state from around the United States. Mm -hmm. So it's just a great time to spend a few days here in the Panhandle. And and you were mentioning the reason why we didn't get the Warner family rum <laughs> cake this morning is because? My wife has been busy in the legislature. Yeah, and, that's right. Uh, she got elected uh, to represent just north of Morgantown and uh, she's enjoying it and i'm enjoying having her in charleston when i'm there very cool very nice that's uh, wonderful uh also um i know that uh, your martinsburg office is one of your busier offices and uh, you I, I guess made a stop there recently and uh, tell me all the things that people can do at the martinsburg office it's pretty much anything that you can do in the secretary of state's office we just have some wonderful employees and we've got a new one there that i'll be meeting today for the first time uh laura engel so i'm excited to do that uh, but it's it's basically a, a, the one-stop shop. Uh, now we don't have all, like tax work, tax workforce and labor like we do in Charleston, but um, Ashlyn and Amanda and, uh, and Laura can put you right in touch with those people back in Charleston. The neat thing about this is where we've got the phone and computer system set up. Is when you call into the Secretary of State's office, you may think you're calling into the state capitol. They could be answering the phone, and they do answer a lot of the calls out here in the Eastern Panhandle. And we also have a, a, a hub in Clarksburg. So we, it's an integrated system, mm -hmm. and it allows us to do more with less. Uh, so whenever that phone rings, whoever's the first one that's available in any of those three offices answers the call. And uh, it's working out quite well for us. We're getting a lot of compliments about the customer service that we provide by having mm -hmm. all those people working uh, collaboratively. Very nice. A lot of stuff to get into today, Mac. One of the things I wanted to ask you about was a conversation we had with Senator Patricia Rucker yesterday, and she was mentioning an issue she had, although she's having trouble getting co-sponsors any longer, uh, in regards to temporary residents of West Virginia being able to register to vote in the state. They don't pay taxes, they haven't had a permanent residency, but they're here, and they can register and they can vote. She said it was brought to her attention while she was door knocking on the campaign trail. Uh, and she's, I think, introduced that bill every single year she's been uh, in the Senate. What are the rules with registering to vote in West Virginia in regards to your residency? Well, residency is a fact-determined uh, determination, and so it, it isn't just where you might have a, a rental apartment. It's where you lay your head on a on a nightly basis and your intent to, to live there. And so we were talking earlier with John about perhaps somebody having a vacation home in another state or another location. And yes, what happens in that uh, locality, the municipality or the county, may affect your property taxes or uh, restrictions on what you can do on the property and so forth. So you may want to vote in both places, but you better pick one, okay? You don't want to vote in a primary in one location and a general election in another. Pick one, and uh, we look at things such as your driver's license, uh, where you pay utility bills and that sort of thing. So mm -hmm. Patricia's concern, I, I believe, is where people, you are in a very interesting location in the state where you've got Virginia, Pennsylvania, Maryland, people coming in and out uh, frequently. They may live in one state and work here or vice versa. And um, I think this is usually brought up in college towns where the college students come there for nine months of the year and leave. Well, uh, some states encourage that to do same day registrations. So if you're interested in a particular election, that college student can go in and register and vote right away. Well, West Virginia isn't that way. You, you have to be registered ahead of time. We cut off registrations 21 days prior to an election, so the clerks have time to verify that you live where you say you live and that mm -hmm. sort of thing. Um, so I appreciate uh, Patricia's con concern because you're in an area where a lot of people could come across the border and say, we're voting in West Virginia to affect the outcome of election. Remember the case here in Harper's Ferry uh, oh, yeah. just a couple of years ago where uh, two, three votes changed the outcome of a city council election. It went to court. It took a year and a half to resolve. So people talk about widespread voter fraud. Whenever they put that word widespread in there, it really irritates me because how much voter fraud is, uh, is allowed in election? And these city council and county commission races sometimes come down to a handful of votes or less. So somebody could come across from another state, register to vote, and vote. Uh, and that's what Patricia's bill is designed to do, is to stop that. She just wants the people living here, actual residents, voting in the, the elections. Are there, in are there safety uh, precautions in effect that uh, someone who's temporarily residing here could come in West Virginia and vote and then send an absentee ballot back to their home state as well? Well, that's what we are trying to 
prevent with all the efforts to clean up the voter registration lists and remind mm-hmm. people that we've taken off over 365,000 names from the voter registration list since I've been in office. That's about one in four have come off. That's how bloated our rolls were. And I mentioned the, blo- the bloating because those are opportunities for fraud or malfeasance to occur. Uh, and, and it just bloats the, the system. It, it clogs up the, uh, the, the poll books and that sort of thing. So um, that's my opposition. And most of the people in West Virginia are not for voting by mail. They like to vote on Election Day in person, and that's the safest, most secure form of voting. So uh, what COVID presented was this opportunity for a lot of people to vote by mail. The thought was in a number of states, well, since we did it once, we should do it in perpetuity. But even the post office only has a 96% delivery on time uh, by their own admission, by their own reports. Well, 96 sounds pretty good if you're taking a test in high school. You, you want a 96. But when you're dealing with ballots, uh, you don't want a 96. You want a 100% uh, return. And that's why we want people voting in person, uh, either er- during early voting, where you see your ballot go in the box, or on Election Day. And only if you have a, a reason, a good reason, uh, as described by the legislature, we have 11 stated reasons why you can vote an absentee ballot. And that's why I think the West Virginia elections have been so secure and people have such high confidence in our elections is because of that access is is there, but also the security component to balance that access is there. And uh, so some quick numbers for you. Typically, prior to COVID, throughout the entire state, we only had 7,000 average absentee ballots coming in. After COVID, we, we then allowed people to vote during that one election, the May primary of 2020, and we had about 224,000 people vote using an absentee ballot. But that was because the governor had us under a stay-at-home order. That was an extremely rare exception. And I had talked to the chairman of the Democrat Party, the chairman of the Republican Party, the governor, the attorney general. Everybody was on board with this one-time uh, occurrence. Interestingly enough, after that, after he withdrew the stay-at-home order, we dropped back down to about 13,000 absentee votes, uh, ballots in the 2022 election. So we're back down to the historically uh, in neighborhood of the historically average. We did not go to a let's vote by mail system. The legislature never pushed that. Nobody's really pushing us for that. We have a few on the, the left that, uh, that want this universal vote by mail, but it's not a secure form of voting uh, as we're seeing in a number of other states. There are issues with it, uh, not only the cost, the uh, People, I'll tell you this, um, Bachman, uh, the, the woman that ran for president out of Minnesota, mm-hmm. she got Michelle Bachman, she got eight absentee ballots sent to her house in Minnesota. Now, you think of the, you know, how absurd is that? Here was a presidential uh, candidate, and the Minnesota is sending out these vote-by-mail uh, ballots, and she got eight sent to her house. We don't want that in West Virginia where people have – uh, multiple ballots coming to their house, uh, the, the opportunity and the inducement to, for fraud uh, is, is there, and we don't want it. Uh, we've had a history of uh, fraud in West Virginia, and we've cleaned that up now. We don't want to go back to it. I want to get back to Senator Rucker's residency uh, bill. Why is there? Why is this not a slam dunk? Where's the Where's the resistance to that? It just seems so obvious. Recently, there has been this push against any change in the election law. We saw this down in Florida after the 2020 election. See, they had opened it up like most of the other states with this voting by mail. And then Georgia tried to implement some common sense security measures, such as voter ID and can't use drop boxes, those sorts of things. Well, you saw the backlash. They moved the Major League's Baseball All-Star Game out of Atlanta over to Denver. There's some real irony in that. Um, and they labeled it as Jim Crow 2.0, that it was voter suppression. So for Jim Eagle, I believe, and, at and, one and point. Jim Eagle, yes. the other president. But um, the, uh, the facts didn't show that out. In 2022, after Georgia had implemented these measures, the voting uh, percentages actually went up. People are more confident in the, in the elections when you have this security component to it. And the numbers actually went up in Georgia. And they elected a Democrat. I mean, this isn't a Republican-Democrat thing. It, it just pe- When people have confidence in their elections and that their vote is going to count, but people's vote, one person, one vote, not one person, multiple votes, uh, then the confidence goes up and people participate. I argue that the worst form of voter suppression is when people lose confidence in the elections and they just stay home or they say, my vote isn't going to count or it's going to be canceled, canceled out by somebody bringing in more ballots than they should, that sort of thing. So uh, I'm all in favor of what the West Virginia legislature has done. They've done a nice balance between 
giving people access. We have more ways to vote than anybody else, any other state. We have in-person voting on Election Day, which is most uh, secure. We have in-person early voting. We have absentee voting, which you have a reason for. You have to give a reason. And then we're allowing certain people, members of the military, uh, first responders, members uh, with certain disabilities are able to vote using a mobile device, first in the nation to do this. We're leading the nation. And it all is shown by MIT. There's a guy, Charles Stewart, out of MIT, who has put West Virginia in the top 10 states in voter confidence in our elections. That's where we want to be. It's working. Uh, and that's why I've been called to testify in front of Congress twice as to how West Virginia is making such secure elections, having such great turnouts, and what we would recommend to other states. Uh, so it's, I take pride in the fact that I was able to represent the clerks of West Virginia, and again, both Republican and Democrat. They want clean elections. They want those voter rolls cleaned up. We've done it. We've achieved what the rest of America wants to be, and that is having voter confidence in our elections. Is it a high bar for absentee ballots? If I, for example, if I just know that I'm going to be on vacation on Election Day, can, is that enough to? That that's enough. The okay. thing of it is, it can be verified. Let's say you mark that you're going to be out of town, but then on Election Day, people see your car parked in the the, the, the driveway and see mm -hmm. you going out to get the paper. They could challenge that, so they could go to the clerk and say, he voted absentee, but. He was here on Election Day and check it out that the vote could then be challenged. And then it's up to the county commission uh, on sure. canvassing day as to whether to count that vote or not. You may have a good reason, you know, that you, you returned early or something. Right. Uh, so, yes, but the answer is yes to your question. Matt Harvey. Good morning, Mr. Secretary. Good morning. <clears throat> could you uh, just uh, read? Um, explain to people your relationship between your office and the circuit or the county clerks? when it comes to elections? Uh, great question, and it's something very fundamental that people need to understand. The county clerks run the elections, okay? I'm the chief elections officer for the state, but my job is to assist the county clerks in doing their job, training the clerks, and by way of example, we've now got over 95% of the people in West Virginia using the express vote system. It's the most modern, secure uh, form of voting. I think now everybody uh, here is, is voted on the express vote system. Uh, but th when that came into being, you had some training. And we would like to use the analogy of ordering a wrap at uh, Sheets. If you can go on there and punch in your order and so forth, that's very similar to the express vote system. It, it's an electronic pen that marks your ballot for you. So if you're using a paper ballot, there are all kinds of ways people confuse how you're supposed to fill in. So think of taking your ACT and you're filling in the circles. You're supposed to fill it in completely. What if you put a check mark or an X or you circle that? There are a lot of ways of messing up a paper ballot. But on the express vote system, it marks it for you. And it also keeps you from overvoting. Or if you undervote, it reminds you that you can still vote if it says vote for two candidates. So the express vote system is a very secure, uh, efficient way of voting. And that's the sort of thing that we train the clerks on. And so then they can train the poll workers when it comes to election time. Mm -hmm. Is that a blockchain technology? No. Not, is not that necessary. something that's been discussed at any of your meetings? Well, the blockchain may have come in. You may have heard that when we do the mobile voting. One of the uh, vendors used a blockchain technology. We did that back in the 2018 uh, election, 2020 and 22. We, we went with a web-based system. Uh, but just back to the clerks real quick. I just can't say enough about the clerks. And, again, it doesn't matter which uh, political party. Uh, like when we, I testified in front of Congress, we had 54 or 55 county clerks that had signed a paper saying they did not want some of those provisions in uh, H.R. 1, the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, for the People's Act. that keeps coming back up at the national level trying to take over our elections. And the clerks in West Virginia spoke loud and clear and said, no, we want to run these elections the way that we have done it historically in West Virginia. We don't want you to take over the elections. We don't want to have same-day registration. We don't want to have a voting by mail. We don't want uh, automatic voter registration. Some of these things that was, were being pushed by the left, it's like, no, we're doing just fine here in West Virginia. Our legislature can tell us how to run the, leg the elections. We don't need the federal government telling us how to do it. Let's talk about SB 522 a moment, Mac, and you can tell us uh, what the status of this bill is. It works its way through the legislature. Is, is this the one that... Uh, yes, the funding for the clerk's office. Funding offices. for the clerk's yes. Right now, a couple of years ago, legislation was passed that uh, they were going to, that the legislature or was going to give money back to the counties, I think 10% a, a year or whatever, that they had been collecting in taxes. And so what... Uh, the clerk, uh, Brian Wood, uh, out of Putnam County, he's the head of the Clerks Association, had the idea of 
the funding that comes from the federal government is a hit or miss type thing on upgrading um, election equipment, uh, like we were just talking with the express vote system. What we'd like to do is within the state, as I mentioned before, having the state run its elections, have a funding source to do that sort of maintenance, upkeep, upkeep, bringing in new equipment such as electronic poll books and so forth. So his idea is that rather than uh, just turning it back to the counties for general use, one year uh, that 10 percent would go towards election uh, related uh, equipment and funding. And so that's what the essence of that bill is, is to give the clerks a funding source so that if the federal government cuts off the funding or doesn't provide funding, then um, we, we can do this ourselves. And that's what some of the states are now pushing back, saying we don't want or need the federal government's money because when you get money from the federal government, it comes with strings attached and you have to do reporting and you may not be able to spend it. You, you have to go through your legislative process mm -hmm. to determine how that money is to be spent. And if the legislature is not meeting for another year and there's a deadline to report back to the federal government, this funding from the federal government can actually be more of a burden to you administratively than just doing it yourself. Uh, we here in West Virginia, we've gotten about $11 million from the federal government over the last couple of years. This was because of HAVA, the Help America Vote Act money, CARES money. This was the, uh, in relation to the COVID money and so forth. And what we did is we leveraged that 50-50 with the county. So if the county wanted new equipment, they had to put up 50% of the money. 50% came from the federal government. So we've really gotten about $22, 23000000 million worth of value out of this. So I like, you know, if the federal government's going to give us some money, we're going to use it and, and get it out as, as much as we can. But you can't always count on that. One year it was sure. eight or nine million dollars. Next year it's one or two million dollars, and you really don't know what the federal government's going to do year to year. So uh, that's what this 522 bill would do: is stabilize that or give the clerks a funding source on a regular basis, so we don't have to count on the federal government. Do you know what its status is in terms of the odds of it passing? I do not. I have not been able to keep up between. There's so many other things going sure. on, especially with taxes down there in the state house. I haven't uh, stayed on top of that. There's a comment on our Facebook page, and I know we've addressed this before and I think it's important to understand where your uh, jurisdiction ends as opposed to what the county clerks control and the comment had to do with the lack of um, mail-in voting for people who don't have a valid reason to not be able to show up at the polls and the comment was if we don't have mail-in voting can we at least have more early voting in more locations more early voting in more locations is not your domain that's the local county clerk correct well, the legislature describes 10 days of early voting, and that covers two Saturdays, and they have a definite start and a definite end. Um, and so typically right now it ends on the Saturday right before the election on Tuesday, and that has jammed up the the clerks. It pretty, make, pretty much makes them work on Sunday to get ready for those poll books to go out on Monday so people have them at the precincts on Tuesday. And there was an effort here a year or two ago to move that back so that early voting would end on the Wednesday and give the clerks more time. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was not taken up by the leg or wasn't passed by the legislature didn't get out of committee um, so I think West Virginia has it about right 10 days of early voting is enough time for people to get to the courthouse or you can still vote on election day and if you can't make those you can ask for that absentee ballot so that's that balance between access and security some of these states vote as early as 45 days ahead of time now you think of the amount of things that can happen between 45 days out and election day think of the Mueller report think of the Comey back and forth this is, we're talking a few years ago with the FBI revelations about both Trump and Clinton just days before four days before the election uh, you don't want to cast that vote and then all of a sudden have a Hunter Biden laptop story come out and then say, well, wait a second, I want to take my vote back. So that's why we want to get back closer and closer to an election day rather than election season. Uh, you get more secure voting, you get uh, more confidence in the elections and so forth. But, so, but in regards to the number of early voting locations? Again, that's a, that is a clerk and a county commission thing. That, that is it, not your office. Like, that's correct. Right. Yeah, okay. I'm glad you brought that up. I'm going to play my curmudgeon card here. <laughs> okay. I, you, voting is a big deal. I mean, that's really in the United States. <laughs> everything goes on. I'm not sure that it needs to be just stupid easy. I mean, you know, shouldn't there be some effort? It's okay to have some level of effort to actually go out to a polling place, provided you can. There are exceptions to all of this. But these 45-day long voting, just to, to drag it out and, and not only invite fraud, 
but it's all done under the guise of making it simple. I just, I'm not sure that it needs to be all that simple. Well, and there's a cost associated with that. Think of the poll workers or the, the county clerks in their offices and people streaming through. They have enough other things to do. These county clerks are overworked and underpaid yeah. and their staff. Um, so th- there are a number of reasons. I'm really glad you, you brought that up. Matt Harvey. Could you, could you discuss the Moore versus Harper federal case? Yeah, it's a really interesting case that's already been argued in front of the Supreme Court on December 7th, and we're waiting for a decision probably before June. That is a case that uh, deals around the independent state legislature principle. And what this is, is on North Carolina, there was a gerrymandering, a redistricting, and it was brought suit uh, by the, the, the opposing party and said that the state court should be determining the boundaries because they thought there was an improper political uh, gerrymandering. But Article One, Section 4 of the U.S. Constitution says that the time, manner, and place of elections shall be done by the legislature, not by the attorney general, not by the secretary of state, not by the courts, the governor. It says the legislature is the one that determines how the elections shall be run. And so that's what's at issue is here is should the courts decide the the appropriate boundaries or should the legislature well the um, legislature uh, has, has drawn these lines and I'll do a quick analogy to article 2 of the Constitution article 1 deals with Congress and the powers of the legislature article 2 deals with the presidency the commander-in-chief so if the article 2 says that the president of the United States is the commander-in-chief if he decides to send 500 soldiers to Yemen to protect our embassy do we really want a court to say, no, 500 is too many, we're only going to send 250? Or no, Yemen isn't as important as Somalia, let's send those to Somalia. No, you don't want somebody second-guessing the commander-in-chief, okay? He's got resources and access to intelligence and all sorts of things. We want one person in charge. So let's go back to Article One. There the Constitution says the legislature is in charge. Let's not have a court or somebody else arguing against the powers of the legislature that the Constitution gave them. So that's the issue in Moore v. Harper, this case out of North Carolina. And let me give you now in the elections arena why this is so important to us. Think of Pennsylvania in the 2020 election. The state legislature had written into code that ballots, valid ballots, have to be in by the close of polls on election day. There was a a party that sued the Secretary of State in the same party and went in front of a judge of the same party and they got a consent decree to say we will accept ballots three days after the election. And that's what caused a lot of this consternation after the 2020 election. They actually accepted ballots three days after and counted those ballots, contrary to what the legislature had written. So this is where this Morvey Harper case would come in. That if the legislature says they have to be in by close of business on election day, they have to be in. If something comes in the day after, they shouldn't be counted. In Pennsylvania, what happened is around Philadelphia, those county clerks counted those ballots that came in after. In rural Pennsylvania, they didn't count those ballots. So you have this discrepancy in one state, and that's why Texas sued Pennsylvania. West Virginia joined into that lawsuit with 17 other states, and it went to the U.S. Supreme Court. The U.S. Supreme Court didn't hear the case because of a legal technicality, standing of one of the uh, the plaintiffs. So it was never looked at on the merits, and so the the lower court's case uh, determination stood. But that's what caused a lot of the consternation. I suggest that may have been part of the uprising on January 6th, as people felt frustrated that here was this large discrepancy in votes. They may have sent electors that were uh, determined by improper ballots and then no court would hear the, the or the, the Supreme Court wouldn't hear that case. So that's why I think this Moore v. Harper case is so important, is there may be some more uh, definitive answer on who gets to write the election rules, and the U.S. Constitution clearly says it should be the legislature. What was the reason for the redistricting, the, the reasons given by the legislature in North Carolina to draw that particular district? Was it based on... Well, arguably it was political politics. That, Which it, po- political it was, is, is an okay reason. The courts have held that. Previously. Exactly. We may not like it. If it's their other party, you think it stinks. It's a fear party. It's like, hey, we're getting more uh, representation. Uh, but that's why you, if you don't like it, elect new legislators. Mac, on that note, we're just about out of time, and I know you've got places you have to be as well. Thank you so much for yours today, oh, sir. Thank you for having me, and I always enjoy being with you. Goes quick, doesn't it? It does. Yeah. Hey, thanks so much. Sure. Thank Secretary you. Secretary of State Mac Warner.